Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World City Summit 2021 preview. I am your MC, Deborah Chan from the Centre for Livable Cities. Thank you for joining us from all around the world. Just a note, simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin is available for this session. To access this, click on the interpretation tab on your Zoom toolbar and then select Chinese. Some of you have already submitted questions at registration, but you can still post questions by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. In a few moments, our esteemed speakers, Mr. David Wallerstein, Dr. Mike Short, CBE, and Mr. Chu Men Leong will share their thoughts on how technology can help cities become smarter and greener in a time of disruptions. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Dr. Duong Anduk, Vice Chairman of the People's Committee of Ho Chi Minh City, is not able to join us today. Dr. Duk will still be sharing his thoughts through a recording. Before we do so, let me introduce our moderator, Ms. Huang Yuning. Ms. Huang is the Chief Planner and Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Singapore's Urban Redevelopment Authority, where she oversees the urban planning of Singapore. Without further ado, Ms. Huang, please. Hello. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, let me start off with some thoughts about this topic. I think civilizations have been planning for cities for many centuries. So what we see as smarter and greener technology today is really a continuum of innovations. And uh, from my experience in planning in Singapore, technology and even plans are only means to an end. And the ultimate aim is really about creating a better um, sort of future for everyone and a home that's endearing and a city that's lovable and safe. So I think we should not lose sight of this as we harness the use of data and technology. Well, plans do not serve cities if we can't realize them. And in Singapore, I think urban governance plays an important role. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists what their thoughts are on this and how we think we can bring together the technology to help serve the city. I'll leave the audience to peruse the CVs of our speakers um, online, as I don't want to take away time from them. So let me just explain how the session will be structured. I'm going to ask Mr. David Wallstein to start us off. And uh, David has also put together a paper for this session. He's uh, circulated, I think CLC has circulated the paper ahead of time. So you see there, in, in there, he's outlined five principles that he think will help bring um, technology together and prepare global cities for a dynamic future. Now, I first got to meet David at the previous World City Summit and was struck by his desire to bring technologies to market to help cities thrive. So I'm looking forward to hearing from him about his thoughts on this. So I'm just going to give David five minutes to do his elevator pitch of the paper, and then we'll hear from the other speakers. So David, the mic is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and great to uh, be able to address this very esteemed group of city leaders from around the world. And thank you to uh, Singapore and CLC for having having me. Um, so I'm I'm the chief exploration officer of Tencent and been working with Tencent for over 20 years. And as chief exploration officer, um, I would like to explain what that role is. That role is to focus on global challenges and then think about how technologies can be applied to address those global challenges. And in particular, next generation technologies, things like robotics or artificial intelligence or electric transportation or things like this, okay? Um, and uh, what I have found over the years um, in supporting many startups around the world, uh, we have probably about 70 under me and Tencent has invested in hundreds of, of startups around the world and very active. We often find that um, technology struggled to be adopted in the market. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, what is interesting to me is that I feel there's this big gap um, between what the needs of cities are and the evolving complex needs of cities around the world and the kind of technology that's being developed. And, and then you have startups trying to sell these technologies and find projects in cities and seeing a lot of those startups struggle. 
And at the same time, uh, I've been wanting to go the other way and, and you know, embrace cities and work more with cities to actually figure out what are the key challenges that cities actually need to have solved. And in this process of thinking about this, I've really come to a conclusion and I'll be a little bit unfair to cities for a moment, if you'll let me. I, I, I believe pretty uniformly that cities have not done a good job in guiding the technology industry to develop services and products for your needs. And I think what is missing actually on the planet right now is a much more proactive role by key customers like yourselves. You have all kinds of complex needs. 55% of humanity lives in your borders and it's going to 65% pretty soon. And that's as population grows on earth. So you're gonna have more and more populations uh, to, to deal with. Um, that's pretty certain. And at the same time, um, technologies are being built that, that don't really address your biggest challenges um, of all kinds now, not just COVID, but anything from water stress to power issues and so on and so forth. My suggestion is that cities get organized and think of yourselves as participants in the global technology development process. Here's the thing. You guys are the experts on what needs to be developed. You've got 55% of the population in your cities and growing. You don't need to worry so much about the fact you maybe don't fully understand every aspect of autonomous driving or robotics or AI or something like this. That's not the most important thing. These are just tools, by the way, like cameras and nails. Technology is just a tool that humans use to build a skyscraper or build a car or whatever. What needs to be built? You are the experts in this and you should be building processes that define those challenges, your priorities very clearly, and then establish a set of processes that can encourage and incentivize the market to build for your challenge. And maybe some of those challenges are things that uh, the market isn't even really thinking about right now. Maybe it's not you know, autonomous driving. Maybe it's something else that no one is talking about. Um, and this is really, I write a paper about this, but I wanted to make you know, this pitch clear you know, and a question to ask yourselves, you know, uh, just hearing what I'm saying now and reflecting, you know, how prepared are you really? Uh, how much do you do honestly right now to try to incentivize the market? How far ahead are you thinking about what your greatest challenges are? These are your absolute top priorities that are looming on the horizon um, that maybe you haven't spent enough time thinking about because you have other immediate pressures. Um, and how can you get more organized to actually develop uh, practices and, and administrative um, infrastructure in place to consistently be uh, defining those challenges, expressing those challenges to your constituents and to the market, and, and then working with technology companies to get things developed that you precisely need. And uh, maybe some of you are, are doing really good at, at it, and we don't know enough about that. And it would be great to hear about those case studies. If you're struggling with it, uh, take a look at the essay I wrote, because I think getting started isn't as complicated as it sounds. Uh, politically, sometimes it can be complicated and resources are scarce, but I think it really starts with with wanting to address these challenges and wanting to get organized. So I'll leave my, uh, my opening comments at that. Uh, I hope that that challenges people to think about this um, in novel ways. Uh, thank you so much for having me again. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. And I'm hearing that technology is just a tool and that cities should get organized and be participants in the global technology development. I think that's a great segue to bring in Dr. Mike Short. Um, Dr. Short is the Chief Scientific Advisor of the United Kingdom's Department for International Trade, and he will be sharing his take on how technology can be harnessed to improve cities. So over to you, Dr. Short. Uh, good evening, and it's a great pleasure to be with you today. I've got a few slides which illustrate some of the examples of uh, some of the things we're doing uh, to make cities smarter and greener. Uh, may I just start by saying I agree with David Wallerstein's point about the tools? Uh, because bringing the tools together, there's so such a big toolkit available these days compared to, say, 20 years ago. So whether it's a new city or a uh, an evolutionary city such as Singapore or a big city such as London, some of these tools can be applied in so many different ways. But one of the key points is going to be about the use of data. Unless data is better shared, then I think some of these tools won't be so effective. And one of the great things we see in London is that the London Data Store has really helped to enable all sorts of innovation and digital applications in London, uh, my great city. 
Uh, next slide, please. So the framework we, we often use is that it's an ecosystem and the ecosystem has to be built on data, has to be built on skills, but there are many systems actors or technologies in the toolkit, uh, whether it's data analytics and automation, uh, whether it's blockchain for identity management, some of the areas about sensing, particularly for air quality and temperature and climate monitoring. Some of the location techniques are absolutely vital, but fundamentally there has to be an ICT or a telecoms and internet infrastructure underneath it all. It's the real foundation for a smart city. Next slide, please. When we think about how those enablers underpin so many systems, sometimes they're designed around a sector such as health or energy. Sometimes they're designed around transport and mobility. Sometimes the buildings, the infrastructure, the governance. I don't think a smart city is really a smart city unless it brings together those elements, even if those different sectors or elements uh, are brought together under the umbrella of smart city. Next slide, please. And in terms of technology, we're already seeing examples how technology can monitor crowds to help security. Uh, certainly during the London 2012 Olympics, technology was used very significantly to manage the Olympics very well and securely. When we look at transport, we're seeing more and more mobile ticketing and payment services of which Singapore has some leading examples uh, in areas such as air quality. Internet of Things is monitoring air quality and, and the move towards electric vehicle charging needs to be managed. How do you get told when there's a spare space, parking space to charge your vehicle? How do you direct your car to the right vehicle without location technology? How do you optimize your traffic without thinking about mapping in the process? And clearly areas like remote consulting, we've seen all sorts of uh, techniques for telecare and telemedicine during this COVID crisis. And we need to do more of this uh, uh, remote connected activity to make our cities smarter. Next slide, please. These are just some examples of some of the things that we've been doing in the UK, whether it be through the uh, Open Data Institute, ODI, or some of our UK 5G trials and test beds. Some of them have been very focused around making cities more efficient. Some of our uh, recommendations uh, have, have been sitting through, through our Connected Places Catapult, which is an accelerator for new ideas in cities. And we've exchanged ideas with Singapore and indeed other cities uh, around that. But also thinking about sensing and innovation together. Uh, we've had lots of trials recently. This is blended together with key universities. Some of those shown on the right. So the Cambridge Centre at Cambridge University is doing some work on digital twins because actually modelling a city is very helpful, particularly if you have a, a second version that allows you to trial an experiment. And uh, the University of Surrey, as well as other universities, have been doing some really good work on researching advanced technologies such as 5G and making sure they fit cities within our trials and test beds, making sure some of the areas to do with uh, uh, the examination and evolution of cities is considered uh, with strong university and skills potential. Petras is also a very strong grouping of universities looking at the Internet of Things. Next slide, please. We also see the role of government and uh, public bodies having to work with the private sector. So some of those mechanisms are very important to think about. The UK government has plans to invest uh, in R&D globally uh, to, to around £22 billion by 2024. And that's a real step up in investment in R&D. But some of these have to be sector based. So we've got a big clean growth strategy within that. That's underpinning some of the uh, move towards cleaner uh, vehicles, uh, more uh, effective electrification, if you like. It's also supporting areas to do with the COP26 summit that the UK is hosting uh, in Glasgow in uh, November this year. And I hope many of the guests will be considering attending that in their own capacity. We also think about the legislation in this area because underpinning legislation is a really another big tool in the toolbox. Thinking about how the procurement process brings innovation in, not just based on lowest price, but maybe based on sustainability, maybe based on longer term uh, environmental issues. Some of the trade activities I'm more involved with personally because I'm the chief scientist for international trade. Next slide, please. We also have a smart cities directory available to everybody. There's a, um, a web link at the end of this presentation. 
And this covers 150 UK companies that are already involved with smart cities, including some company case studies, including some city projects based on Glasgow, Peterborough and Bristol. And we have other knowledge about some of the other companies and their activities within that directory in the nine subsectors shown. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to speak today. I'd be very happy to take any questions arising. If you need more, please use the slides that are shown and indeed the web link I've made available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So what I'm hearing is that it's really about bringing the tools together, bringing the elements of the sectors together into an ecosystem so that it can deliver the results that we need to help cities be smarter. And uh, Mike, you've put up a lot of useful resources for the audience to kind of look further into. So thank you for that. Now let's turn to Dr. Dong An Dok. Dr. Dok is unable to join us, but here he is in a pre-recorded message. So let's hear from him, from his perspective, from Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to attend the work series submit today. It has been a difficult time for all of us the COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on the way humanity lives and works. The pandemic has also accelerated the digitization of every aspect of our life, including smart city. Developing smart city and promoting digital transformation are the important ways for Ho Chi Minh City to effectively utilize the opportunity of the four industrial revolutions to solve urbanization challenges in particular, the COVID-19 pandemic is still ongoing in an unpredictable trajectory. Its negative impacts lead to the need for sustainable smart city development. A smart city appearance is gradually taking shape and becoming more and more visible throughout Ho Chi Minh City. After three years of implementing Ho Chi Minh City Smart City Action Plan, Ho Chi Minh City has achieved some results which have contributed to improving the quality of forecasting, planning, and administrating work of local governmental agencies. Initially, provided some smart utilities to serve its people and businesses. Especially, some modern applications have well supported the city to prevent and control the COVID-19 pandemic. Ho Chi Minh City will continue to implement a number of key tasks and solutions to develop smart city projects in Ho Chi Minh City. First of all, we will continue to educate people and businesses about purpose and meanings of smart city, thereby encouraging them to participate in proposing solutions and initiatives. The commitment of the local government at all levels and the support of all the people and businesses are important factors for the most effective smart city implementations. Second, we will continue to develop the city share data warehouse, focusing on building databases of citizens, businesses, topography, and cadastre. Deploying share digital maps, extend the share data warehouse, as well as provide data mining utilities to serve citizens, businesses, and governmental agencies. These are prerequisites for the successful implementation of the city social economy. Simulations and Forecast Center and Intelligent Operations Center, which will exploit all the city daily information and data sources in own fields, thereby helping the rescue, handle situations, and help leaders at all levels to make well-informed decisions. Thus, developing the Intelligent Operations Center by integrating its subsystems, such as the Integrated Emergency Communication System, Camera Surveillance, implementing the social economic simulation and forecasting center to help defining development orientation, supporting the city governance for effectively implement eGov architecture for the city supporting digital transformation, aiming to achieve digital government, deploying technology applications in management by using big data, IoT and other advanced technologies. Focusing on implementing and introducing applications and facilities for citizens, enterprises, and public. Improving the interaction and communication between city governments and citizens. Promoting creativity and applications of advanced and modern technology in solving public demands so that the city can enhance the city citizen satisfaction on the performance of the government. 
active developing the digital infrastructure, 5G mobile network, internet of things, and other digital platform for smart city and digital transformation. Sixth, fostering research and implementation of artificial intelligence, aiming to achieve an AI ecosystem, making AI key technology for digital transformation and smart city development. And I hope Ho Chi Minh City will be a leading city in ASEAN in the fields of AI research and development. Last but not least, focusing on training and developing human resources in ICT for smart city, driving further international partnership and experience exchanging in smart city. Developing Ho Chi Minh City towards a smart city is an important orientation with strategic meaning to the development of the city in 2021 to 2025. Developing smart city aims to solve challenges in urbanization and achieve development goals, thus help improving the qualities of life in Ho Chi Minh City. Once again, I would like to thank the organizing board to, for giving me the opportunity to share with you the smart city goals of Ho Chi Minh City. I hope that in the coming times, we will continue to exchange our experience and ideas in this field. Ho Chi Minh City welcome organizations and businesses in smart city sector to come to Ho Chi Minh City to explore opportunities to work with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duke. Uh, Dr. Duke underlined the importance of bringing the various initiatives together into an action plan so that it can be more concertedly implemented. And I really like what he said about people, that we need to bring people along and make sure they understand the purpose and the meaning and also be able to then support and contribute to the various initiatives. Now I turn to my in-person studio <laughs> partner here, Chu Ming Leong. Ming Leong is the president of Urban Solutions of ST Engineering. I first got to know Ming Leong when he was in uh, PUB or Singapore Water Agency and later Singapore's Land Transport Authority. I very much admire Ming Leong's balance of vision and pragmatism and I look forward to hearing your views. So Ming Leong, take it away, please. Uh, thank you, Yuni. Um, David mentioned about uh, technology being a tool. I would say that technology is an important strategic tool the to transformation of cities to become smarter and greener. I think if cities are clear about the urgent challenges they need to solve, then I would say the judicious application of uh, smart city technologies will be the key to unlock the solutions to overcome these challenges. Ultimately, I think it will be the technology and the change they bring to cities that holds the key to continue good quality of life, even amidst the challenges uh, from threats like COVID and climate change. So what are these changes that technology can bring to cities? Uh, I would like to suggest three areas of change that are driven by advancing technology. First up, connectivity. Uh, Moss law, yes, it is still relevant. Thanks to Moore's Law, we now have increased bandwidth, reduced latency, better network coverage at lower cost per connection node. So connectivity has become pervasive, real-time, and more affordable. And in fact, costs of IoT sensors have fallen over something like 300% over the last 15 years. So what does that bring? Obviously, real-time infrastructure connectivity driven by IoT 5G, So, which means the buildings, critical infrastructure, transport infrastructure, all getting connected, right? So, what does that lead to? Public transport efficiency, reliability also rises. Road congestions can be reduced rapidly. Automation at workplace, homes, hospitals becomes much more possible. Remote working, contactless processes, which we're all now getting very used to, has become viable. And not to mention that we, cannot, we can now abstract complexities to a simple application on your phone. And even the feedback channel on how you want to improve your city can be... I think, again, uh, extracted down to a single, your virtual phone button. So that's connectivity. Next, of course, will be resilience. Today, we have huge proliferation of sensors, sensor platforms, combined with data analytics, AI, ultimately leading to new benefits for better security and hence resilience against uh, ever-evolving threats. Today, with technology, it's a lot more easy, I think a lot easier for cities to achieve uh, full awareness of what's going on across the cities, combined with remote surveillance, even crowdsourcing. And then you add in sense-making to detect anomalies, you can find out where the threats are, prompting very timely intervention. And even the humble lampposts that we see across the city can easily be wired up to become your new eyes and ears across the streets 
become a city sentinel, if you like. Monitor traffic, potential threats, even checking against the environment uh, as the weather changes. So, uh, in fact, this same technology is in this current uh, climate of pandemic gives you option for faster contact tracing, enforcement of safe distancing. So all in all, sensors, sensor platform, AI, DA, brings you greater city resilience against threats. And last, sustainability. I think this is, I think, most well understood by many. Uh, smart city technologies will help basically drive utility efficiency within the city. So things like intelligent power grids with uh, energy storage helps you to optimize injection of renewable energy, less leakage, less wastage, helps you to close the energy water loop. Bottom line is to bring everybody closer to net zero townships. And uh, of course, buildings. Buildings, infrastructure, estates are all getting smarter. So you can actually put in on-demand lighting, air con, waste management, so they can adjust to the prevailing building uh, traffic. And technology helps you to close the feedback loop, give you a better understanding of your own consumption patterns, helping you to be more conscious, save more, bottom line. And then we have uh, IoT devices that give you predictive maintenance, reduce outages, reduce disruption. All in all, basically it leads to smaller carbon footprint, bringing us, I think, closer again to the goal of net zero. And in the mobility realm, uh, we have proliferation of share rights, electrification, autonomous, and even the complexity of journey planning, booking, and paying for uh, your transport can now be extracted to a simple application. So what does that mean? More convenient, more efficient, more affordable options for you to move from A to B without car ownership. So ridership in public transport goes up, more walk cycle rides to complete journeys, share rights proliferates, and private transport goes down. We all know less congestion, less pollution, less CO2. So again, lower carbon footprint per passenger kilometer travel. So ultimately, I think technology is going to be a game changer. Uh, I would say that uh, for all the cities, let's identify a challenge, call in the industry, let them engage you, work with you, and see how we can judiciously apply the latest smart city technologies. Smart technologies that will not cost you the earth literally, yet bring you connectivity, resilience, and sustainability. A sustainability, helping you to make, of course, your city smarter, greener, and most importantly, leading to continual improvement of quality of life, even amidst threats. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Min Leung. So certainly the technology holds a lot of promise, and how do we begin to unlock this promise? I think it's a real challenge. Now let's take a look at the poll results from earlier on. I think we can take that as a reference as we start our discussion. Well, there's a quite a widespread of where people think their cities are. And what are the key technology that they want to focus on? There's also a good spread of that. So a lot of potential business for you, Minlong, <laughs> and also David, I suppose. Also. Yeah. Well, well, let's start with a question to get us going then. Um, I think this is uh, one that's come up quite a bit from our audience from, um, on suggestions on how developing cities, which were not well be planned to begin with, can embark on technology transformation towards a smart city. So where do they even begin if the city wasn't well planned to begin with? And I think a related question to this um, is about how to find cost-effective and sustainable smart initiatives. Uh, so maybe I can get Mike to get us going on this question, if you could. Happy to comment. Um, in terms of where do you start, uh, I think you need a governance structure that says, what is your vision for your city? That has to be local governance, but embracing the right skills. Once you have the governance structure, the mission, if you like, there need to be some clear targets and targets that are measurable and easy to implement. One of the key areas I think is necessary is to make sure that uh, there is a focus on data. Uh, a lot of these tools depend on getting access to data, but also then sharing the data to allow innovation to occur. And taking um, Ben Leong's uh, points about connectivity, connectivity is a very good start point to help gather the data. But it's very important to, as well thinking about a data store as mentioned by uh, the gentleman uh, representative from uh, Vietnam. 
I think without a data store and the connectivity, it's very difficult to uh, apply some innovation against any vision or governance. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. David, would you like to jump in and comment on that before we turn to Men Leung? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to get this question. You see, the thing is, uh, I'm like the technology guy on the call, or one of them anyways, on, on this uh, discussion here. And Tencent, we have various solutions and our portfolio companies have technology solutions. We know these areas quite well, sensors, AI, IoT, networking. However, that is not going to be my answer to this question because to be quite honest, I don't think those are the values in themselves. Becoming a smart city in itself doesn't have to be the end goal. I think the end goal is actually to make sure that you are addressing your challenges. So I almost feel like the questions could be worded differently. I, I would turn it around uh, to anyone. It doesn't matter if you're the most developed city in the world, so to speak, or you're just getting started in your mind on your, your journey. It's always a, the, the, the challenge is always the same. What are your biggest challenges on the horizon? What must you solve? Uh, and what are your highest priorities? Start with that. And that actually in itself may take some time and there may be disagreement on that. Uh, but I think ultimately you need to decide what those are. And then you start to organize how you're going to address them and, and putting a team together and thinking about budget and process. And then we go to the market and try to see what kind of technologies are available, what kind of sensors are available, what kind of AI is available, what, of course, what kind of data is available because the data needs to be used for, to be applied towards your most highest priorities. Uh, now there's many uh, good benefits you can have by having data available because when you need to uh, find a solution, you have an infrastructure and an architecture for doing that and you'll have many spin-off benefits that perhaps you didn't uh, anticipate. So there will be benefits from preparing you know, data warehousing and all these things. However, what could be lost is that you manage to solve perhaps not your greatest challenges, important things, helpful things, but in, in doing some of these initiatives, you actually left your greatest challenges kind of unaddressed. And by definition, your greatest challenges should be the highest priority. That's why we call them the greatest challenges. So I, I would kind of encourage cities to, to think about what's coming up in the market and how you can take advantage of it in learning from other cities. But at the same time, that doesn't preclude the essential exercise of really defining um, systematically, you know, what must be solved, what needs a priority, even if you've never heard any technology out there that's addressing it, or you haven't heard of anyone else talking about it, it's important to begin that journey and urgently because it's your greatest challenge. So that's my view on, on this question. Thank you, David. Uh, that's a great response. I think it also kind of echoes Mike's point about needing to have vision and clear targets so that we are not just chasing technology uh, without having clarity on what's the challenge we're trying to resolve. Uh, Min Leung? Uh, I, I must say I agree with David that uh, it's important the city to determine what are their most urgent priorities and use that as a starting point. Uh, but I also just want to add that uh, when you look at the problem itself, uh, we can also s take the view that sometimes technology can help you uh, leapfrog the, the challenge itself. And we all, for example, we all know that, uh, say in places like uh, some cities in India where banking infrastructure was completely uh, missing. So what happened? Basically, banking uh, used mobile phone to leapfrog the lack of infrastructure and change uh, access in terms uh, of the citizen to banking. So in the same concept, you can also find technology helping uh, the cities to actually leapfrog and overcome some of these challenges and really solving the problem. Uh, but for some of these developing cities, sometimes uh, just need to be clear where your priorities are. So for example, if you really need to figure out how to save uh, electricity, well, just start working essentially on the street lights. If you have a, if the city has a problem as far as say uh, water leakage is concerned, let's put the technology and solve the water leakage. And by by solving these problems one at a time, I think you can actually make progress, and that in itself will be a good start to uh, I think more cost effective and sustainable smart initiatives. Yeah. yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nods from David and uh, Mike on the leapfrogging kind of. Uh, example that Ming Long brought up. Maybe you all want to come back on this and comment, Mike? Just had to unmute there. Um, 
leapfrogging, I think, is a great opportunity to really have a vision that's not just about today and tomorrow, but having a plan for 2025 or 2030. And I think some of those uh, uh, plans sometimes lead towards unforeseen results. I think uh, also thinking about how do you bring in incubators and accelerators in this area to scale up those solutions? To me, I think bringing those tools together with different skills and different mindsets also helps. Uh, we're blessed in the UK with over 200 incubators and accelerators that continue to innovate in different ways that, that we would not have thought from a central government point of view or a central planning point of view. So I think finding ways of uh, co-creation with different locations on a short-term, medium and long-term basis has to be part of the plan. Thanks, Mike. And David, any thoughts from you on that leapfrog? Yes. Uh, so I, I want to say uh, some things that are kind of provoking here. Uh, I think we're living in very unprecedented times. And as I reflect on that statement, I realize I've been in lockdown for almost a year due to just one virus that, that's evolving. It has new strains. And think of how climate change is changing, you know, everyone's cities and the world around us and how that is anticipated to accelerate. And it's a very important time to think about what technology can enable us to do and asking the question, why do I need to do things the way we've always done it? Uh, let me, uh, of course, you could just think about energy. Why build a coal fire plant that actually doesn't just create pollution and creates a dependency on coal, but also requires water to run the process, the heat, interacts with water and that turns a turbine. Look at all the dependencies you've created if you made that decision, probably imported coal and probably a, a channel, you know, some way to get the water going through the process. If it was wind or solar, you wouldn't have those dependencies. So you can leapfrog when it comes to energy. And a lot of energy, about 50% is used for space heating or cooling, air conditioning or heating anyway. So is even, you know, electricity necessarily the answer to meet those needs? Uh, it depends on your local conditions. But let me go a little bit further. Uh, in the future, you could maybe ask the question, you know, do I even need to continue to build the type of road infrastructure that has historically been built uh, in my city or region around the world? Something that uh, I've been working on myself quite a bit over the past couple of years is electric aviation, um, uh, particularly with a company called Lilium in Germany. And one thing that, uh, you know, the thought process around, uh, you know, bringing this kind of technology to the market is, you know, this question, if this was to become a more popular form of transportation, would we be so dependent on all the tunnels and bridges and things like that that you must build to, to make uh, your city or your region accessible by roads in so many different directions? That could go down. And the question is why, why not do it if it's um, a, a cheaper way to go, uh, the same price uh, you know, as road transportation because it uses a battery. You could do the calculation yourself. How much does it cost to charge the battery uh, versus a, an EV, an electric vehicle? The, the thing is, we're in an era right now where the technology is changing and you can leapfrog. And it's very important, therefore, to understand what technologies are available and ask the question, do we have to do things the way they've been done for the past hundred years? Or in leapfrogging, do I actually create a completely different potential reality for my city that's entirely possible? And uh, I'd like, I think it's an important time to encourage more of that kind of mindset when you understand the technologies that are available. Yep, thank you, David. So uh, cities really need to re-examine whether there's opportunities to use technology to help themselves leapfrog and in a way develop a new reality for the city, a new baseline. Well, since we have people from both the public and private sector, here's a question on how we think governments can better collaborate with the private sector to leverage technology to transform our cities. And uh, for this, I'm going to turn to Min Leung to start us off. Yeah. Actually, you have been in government and in private sector. So probably your best to start us off on this. Yeah, I, I must say, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of how governments and municipal authorities can actually better collaborate uh, with industry, especially coming uh, on to the subject of trying to transform the cities using technology. Uh, I, I got a few points I, I just want to share with you and uh, just food for thought. Uh, and you can carry this with you when you think about how you want to transform your cities. Uh, for one, I think um, it's probably quite important for a city to think about how they can actually allow the industry, especially industry that carries a long view, uh, long view to come and engage you directly uh, to understand your pain points. As David said, I think the industry 
if they don't know what your priorities are, it's also very hard for them to figure out what is it to suggest uh, to bring to you. So let's engage them. Let's allow the industry to engage you. And when you engage, uh, I think when the, when, when the governments and the authorities are engaged with the industry, uh, maybe it should be more open to seeing how we can actually come forward to uh, pilot. I think pilot specifically uh, technologies in a uh, specific area to solve a particular problem so that the technology can be proven. The potential of the technology can be proven uh, and with that, then you can quickly move from what essentially is a, a regulatory sandbox to uh, actual deployment and scale. Uh, I must say this is not something that is uh, so, uh, I think, commonplace or, or really readily thought about by cities, but think about it. How, how to push for resource to pilot, prove the technology, then figure how to move from the sandbox to deployment once it is proven. And when we talk about uh, trying to uh, go for, uh, I think, building up even higher-end smart city capabilities, uh, something that is of much larger scale, uh, I, I would say that the governments and authorities should also think a bit more carefully about how is it that they want to consider uh, working with the, the industry to co-develop some of these capabilities. Uh, in Singapore, I think there are many examples. Uh, I will also share with you, uh, right now, SC Engineering is actually collaborating and co-developing uh, with uh, the JTC agency uh, to develop uh, what we call an open digital platform for a new uh, Pongo digital district. And the whole idea is to actually bring in, I, I would say, the, the, the government which understands the use case and the industry which has the technology and then come together to actually co-develop something uh, that is, I would say, groundbreaking and once implemented will actually make significant impact to the, 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 the smart estate that they are actually aiming for. So these are just uh, some of the, the points that I would like to share with you uh, in terms of how we can do that. And I also want to just uh, so maybe highlight that uh, governments should think about the procurement framework mm, uh, when we're engaging the industry. It's today, uh, smart city technology is, uh, I mean, continues to evolve. And I think especially when you're talking about city-wide platforms, I think it's important to figure out how you can bring agile development into a procurement framework. And it's not easily done. Um, most uh, procurement systems are pretty cut and dry. Um, but I think it's important for governments to think about how they actually bring agile development into the procurement framework. And with that, actually encourage for alliances to come in to see how they develop more complex end-to-end -end systems. Yeah. And just one last point, governments, if they can actually formulate very clearly demand and wants to invest to implement, then the industry knowing there is a commercial pathway, they will also come in to invest and help actually undertake the technical and operational uh, development risk. Right? Yeah, Min Liang, thanks. Actually, Mike, you also spoke about the importance of the procurement process um, in your earlier presentation, and David, one of your five principles was also on the tendering process. So I think both of you would have some thoughts to share as well on this issue of public-private partnership and how to get the procurement process right to help support the technology innovations and deployments. Mike, why don't you start us off first? Just a couple of practical points. I agree with everything that Men Leong has said. Um, I'd also like to say there are a couple of things um, where it's not pure procurement, but it's also uh, regulation. Sometimes the regulations for particular sectors, whether it's energy or, or telecommunications, they think about competition policy. And actually, when you want a smart city, you might want more collaboration. You want, might want more collaboration between competitors to deliver an outcome. And that's a kind of high level principle uh, that even occurs be before procurement. Uh, if you want, for example, a 5G strategy to underpin um, the smarter Singapore, for example, that requires some thinking about the strategy before the regulation and the procurement. I'd also add, I think, that when it comes to public-private partnerships, I think the private side can bring investment, money. So I think the, the role of investors in this area <clears throat> needs to be given a boost in terms of confidence. 
if you have clear objectives of what you might want to achieve through co-creation and design for a smart city, what's the investor role? Some investors might be very willing outside government to submit significant funds for long-term investments for things that have been proven to work. So I agree with the earlier points about piloting and trials, but when it scales up, the role of private industry and investment is very key to this. And that doesn't fit the typical procurement rules. That is more about strategy and working with government around the finance and investment. And lastly, I'd make the point that uh, data is still a key part of this. So having a data strategy is a key part of public-private partnership. What is the data store? What is the data gathering process? What is the data sharing mechanism? And I don't mean revealing private individuals' data, I mean collective data that can be shared for innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And David, your thoughts on the tendering yeah, procurement process? I, I agree so strongly with all the, the points made here. But what I'd like to add, you know, I spend Tencent is a large company, and I think large companies like us and ST, uh, we have decades of operating experience, and we've had an opportunity to build relationships with cities, but. I spent most of my time actually working with startups, investing in them and then supporting them to be a successful. This is actually also very part of um, Tencent's mission and we've, we have been doing that for a long time. And what I see with startups is, is a constant struggle to get any kind of contract whatsoever. And what's so important about startups is that they're, they're often on the cutting edge of innovation one. Um, usually every city wants to attract entrepreneurs. They wanna have a dynamic, innovation economy. And at the same time, I find those same cities that want to embrace that may not necessarily have great policies in place to actually provide projects through a, a, a nimble tendering process that could give some opportunities um, to startups. So something to understand about startups is a, a few things just from their perspective for a moment. They're very small by definition. They have to move fast, meaning within a few months. And any kind of money can often be valuable, like a couple hundred thousand US dollars can actually uh, be quite, quite consequential for a startup, as well as having the active project with your city, um, being able to say that they're doing a project in Ho Chi Minh or Singapore or wherever. So, um, you know, a, a valid project creates so much value to the startup. Um, but what often I have found in supporting our startups and then hearing about their engagements and their progress around the world, trying to get uh, city projects uh, is often that the, the tendering process isn't clear. Uh, it doesn't move fast. It's not clear who has the budget, who really owns the issue, who's trying to get it done. Even you know a $200,000 uh, project is taking months to get approved. Uh, therefore, you know, I, I wanted to just uh, emphasize the importance of this kind of uh, you know, innovation around tendering and having fast track piloting for these priority areas uh, that is very collaborative. That was just mentioned by the other speakers. Um, and, and they don't have to be large amounts. They can be pilots, you know, so like was said earlier, sandbox, but you know, it's a priority area that gets special attention and has a special process for being approved rapidly because it needs that treatment. It's a priority area. And it gives uh, both sides an opportunity to demonstrate that this great idea, this new technology actually works. And once it's proven to work, it can scale up from there. I often, just to add, I felt that innovation around the tendering process in these kinds of highly prioritized innovative areas can also help perhaps reimagine some other aspects of the traditional tendering process, which can just be challenging in its own right. Um, and so even the city could look at it as an opportunity to rethink some, some of the ways they're doing tendering, but do it in also this kind of, you know, it's like a sandbox area where they can be more innovative in, in this process in itself. And, and it doesn't have to reinvent every aspect of tendering. Um, but I, I do really wanna emphasize this. Your city, just to, to say again, has a chance to, to have a significant impact on your local you know, relationship with entrepreneurs and your startup economy with these kinds of fast moving, small scale pilot contracts. It can really make a difference in, in that part of the economy and it's important. So I'll just leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, thank you, panelists. So what I'm hearing is that the procurement is very much part of the innovation uh, ecosystem. You know, so the piloting, the scaling, that's how you bring technology to the city at scale and also help support the innovative uh, cultures and uh, companies. Now maybe we 
not, since Mike, you spoke quite a bit about data, I think here's a question on with the increased use of data, how do we ensure that it's transparent and socially just governance of data in regulating the smart city and deploying all the increased usage of uh, smart and greener technologies? So how do we ensure that the transparency and the socially just governance of data is done? Mike, you want to start well, us off? Uh, if you can hear me all right, I think the issues really start with the governance itself. How do you make sure that there is a good understanding of people who see the benefits of data sharing? And sometimes that gets stopped. If you have a data store, you have to start with what are the benefits of sharing in the first place. <clears throat> Otherwise, people will not contribute data to a data source. Also, th there is more trust if the data is aggregated and anonymized. Clearly, if it's shared on a personal level, then there will be outcry. But I think aggregation and anonymization is key. But when we think about where the data comes from, whether it's from IoT, Internet of Things, or whether it's from particular sectors, it really requires an all smart city buy-in to a data store, such that people can share those benefits and then use the data store, as well as giving and offering data to the data store. Uh, so we've had examples recently with COVID where we've looked at mobile data to help analyze whether lockdown initiatives have been successful or not. Uh, we've seen examples where city planners have used uh, other sources of data to identify the right locations for electric vehicle charging posts. Uh, we've seen um, other cross-sector initiatives where people have used data from financial services or perhaps uh, retail to identify uh, the efficiency of shopping malls in relation to traffic congestion. So it's got to be a cross-sector data approach, which is trusted from the start, where the various contributors know the benefits and potential outcomes that could arise, and then making sure the governance is strong enough to minimise risk of inappropriate leakage or inappropriate use. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So trusted data process from the start, as well as strong governance on the usage of the data. I think those are important points. Uh, Menlong or David, would you like to comment on this? Uh, maybe Menlong first. Uh, on data, I, I only just want to make one uh, point is that uh, as far as the, the city's data is concerned, that I think obviously needs to be held by the government or the municipal authority in charge of the, the city. Uh, while the private se uh, se uh, sector uh, can get involved in terms of uh, collecting this data, but I think it's very important to understand that the ownership of the data must lie solely with the government. And it's also for the government to actually uh, see how to make sure that the data that they, they, they put together, uh, aggregated, can then be subsequently shared openly with the rest of the stakeholders. When you share openly, then I think new ideas will be formed. I think uh, new insights will be, I think, uh, uh, gathered. And from there, uh, I think that will spur, I think, even more initiatives to see how we actually can improve the city. Again, become smarter, greener, ultimately. Thank you, Minel. David, do you want to come in on this question? Yeah. Great points here. I'd just like to add, I think really, you know, using data is really about trust at the end of the day, trust with the population uh, regarding how and why the data is being used, and then intentions and objectives. So uh, just regarding security and privacy, uh, there's many technologies to address that as long as that's indeed the objective of the uh, governments that are responsible for these initiatives, because that that you know, there's many ways to keep that data uh, private or aggregated or anonymized. Uh, building trust is really about being extremely clear about what the objectives are in using the data. And I, I'm thinking high level objectives. So uh, if the goal is to actually improve health outcomes in your population, less incidences of hospitalization or diseases, um, could be COVID, could be cancer, could be all these things. Uh, there are so many ways that you can use data to optimize uh, for those outcomes. And it may not only involve just looking at what's happening in the hospitals, it can involve looking at air pollution, noise pollution, water um, quality, all of these things aggregated throughout the city. But you need to build trust with your population and, and explain that these are the high level objectives of the city 
to say, we are going to be improving the health of our citizens that live in this city here. And here's how we're going to do it. Here are some of the ways that we think we can use data to do it now. And then you'll discover more and more ways to deploy data to do that. But I think it's about building an understanding of the fundamental mission and then finding more and more ways that the data can be harnessed for those outcomes. And then when new opportunities come up or new discoveries are coming up, sharing that with the population, bringing them along to the right, and then showing the results, showing that this is actually working. You know, we are identifying problems. We didn't think about this issue over here, that issue there. We discovered that they were contributing to negative outcomes. We didn't have the water quality we thought we had. We didn't have the air quality we thought we had. We didn't know about this gas, that gas, you know, those kinds of things. And then you're continuously optimizing. But I think it's really about building trust at the end of the day in, in that the best interests of the citizen are at heart and that all of the risks noted are being addressed continuously to optimize on the objectives and reduce any of the negative uh, externalities of, of engaging in these data strategies in the first place. I think it's entirely possible. So David, it starts with trust and I, it's strengthened to having a virtuous cycle of sharing the insights and then further strengthening the insights from the data. Yep, that's great points. Um, well, I think we're running short of time, but let's, let me invite our panelists to share your closing thoughts on this. Um, Min Leung, why don't we start with you, then we'll do David, and Mike, you'll have the last word. Okay, I promise to keep it short. Uh, I just want to say that uh, for all the cities embarking on the journey of transformation, trying to become smarter, greener cities, um, look at the industry as a partner and allow uh, the industry uh, to come and engage you to understand what your priorities are and see how they can bring, I think, technology solutions that will help solve uh, your most urgent problems and ultimately leading to uh, a better quality of life for your citizens. So uh, let the industry be your partner. Thanks. David? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me again today. Uh, the community of technology providers, they're here to serve you, but to be good in what they do, they need to know your needs. And you don't necessarily need to know about all the technologies and the latest uh, developments. There's always going to be something new uh, coming out, but you are truly the experts in what your challenges are and what the priorities are in your area. And again, I think it's such an important time in history as our world is changing and the circumstances of cities uh, can be changing around the world, uh, to be extremely clear about your challenges, what must be built, and then pushing industry to find solutions and finding ways to match that with budget. Uh, and you may need to think about uh, working more with the private sector to meet some of those budgetary needs or other types of investors. But those problems can all be solved if you uh, are, are, are leading the way in driving the solutions for your biggest challenges. So. Um, I know everyone uh, is working hard uh, and, and has various levels of progress at this, but let's just assume there's a lot more that can be done here. Even if you're the strongest city in the world at doing this, you're probably just starting on your journey. And I think this is really going to be a promising next five to 10 years of evolution between you know, your needs and what the industry can do for you if we get this cycle of cooperation uh, going a lot tighter. Thank you. Thanks, David. And Mike, over to you. I think whether it's climate change and net zero, or whether it's reducing congestion in our cities, or whether it's addressing the global pandemic, COVID pandemic, there is no doubt that data is going to be key to this. So I think industry is ready to support all sorts of ideas to improve against those challenges. And I think industry and, and public private partnerships are needed, particularly around data and connectivity to really move the needle, move the agenda in all of these areas. But it's got to be done in a trusted way. It's got to be done with appropriate governance. But I think there are lots of ideas that could help. Please keep the World Cities activity going because I think it's a really impressive way of sharing knowledge in this area. Uh, but I think we need to share even more in the next 10 years than we have in the last 10. Thank you, Mike. So as we heard from this panel, smarter and greener technology alone is not the answer. It holds much promise, but a lot needs to be done to tighten the collaboration, ensure the governance is in place, and make sure that we are working together as trusted partners. 
So thank you. Thank you for a rich, very rich discussion, panelists. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Now back to you, Deborah. Thank you, Mr. David Wallerstein, Dr. Mike Short, and Mr. Chu Men Leong for sharing your thoughts with us today. And thank you to Ms. Huang Yuning for tying the discussion so neatly together. We have come to the end of this session. Do join us online at our next session, public and private, joining forces for climate resilience. This session will take place in two and a half hours. Before you leave, we invite you to use the QR code or link to fill in your feedback. Until our next session, thank you once again and goodbye.